Hey folks, Steve here with a special video for you today. We're going to be looking at End of Empire 1744 to 1782, an exciting simulation game of three key wars of the British Empire in North America. Uh, this is published by Compass Games. It is designed by uh, William Marsh, but I believe he goes by Bill. Uh, Bill or William, I'm not, I'm not sure which he prefers. I've seen his name referenced either way. Um, and this used to be, I think this was originally like some magazine game from way back, but this was published as sort of like a deluxe edition that has kind of had a cult following life of its own since publication. Um, and I'm, I'm one of the, the cult members there, uh, that has watched this game over the years, have fiddled around with it, um, have been very infatuated with it, but I've not played it to a huge extent other than a few fiddly, you know, move encounters around and checking stuff out. Um, and so uh, inspired by some videos that Justigar did um, some weeks or months ago now, the time, is, time flies, uh, I wanted to give it a go uh, on camera and, and finally give this game some, some due diligence because I've had it for a long time. I've wanted to play it more in depth. I've, I've been sort of monitoring it for a long time, uh, and I, I'm going to break some ground here. Now, for those who are uh, consistent watchers of the channel, I do have a separate game series that I'm going to start here very soon uh, that is not related to this. Um, you know, I, I've been giving hints as to what that is, uh, and I'm going to still do that. So this is going to be my attempt to have two different game series going at the same time. What's nice about End of Empire here is that there are a number of different scenarios that you can play, some that are much short, shorter than others. Um, and this game now years after publication, has a lot of stuff and a lot of content possible for it um, that, that one can play and try out. Uh, you just have to put a little bit of work into getting everything set up for it. Um, so it makes a good companion game while I'm doing something much more intense and complex. This is a little bit lighter, generally speaking, and um, I, I just like the time period. It's cool, and uh, we're going we're gonna to hit it up. So I'm, I'm kind of free-floating the camera right now. Uh, Sorry, the unsteadiness of my hand is making it, making you sick. We're going to swing the map over. Well, maybe what I should do is give you some uh, bird's eye view here. So this map is two maps lined up end to end. So it's a long map. And basically it is portraying, you know, basically Louisiana, parts of Florida, all the way up the track to Nova Scotia in the north of colonial America. And the situation that I have set up here, which is uh, maybe a little unconventional for what, we're, what we would normally be looking at, is King William's War. Now I have this little uh, slip of paper here that says King William's War, not to tell you that it's King William's War, but because this part of the map is non-playable area effectively for the French. And so it made sense to me just to block it off with something. And sure enough, I had a little slip of paper uh, that I kept in the baggie. Um, in this game, the counters for the different scenarios tend to be their own sort of force pulls. Uh, something that William Marsh did in the design of this game is he liked 1776, which is sort of this more well-known uh, game on the American Revolution. And he just kind of took several ideas from that and ramped it up. So each counter in this game it tends to represent a very specific regiment or unit that historically existed in the conflict that you're playing um, and gets away from like the more arbitrary, you know, here's a strength point and it represents this amount of men. You're really talking about a specific uh, unit that existed or some, some you know, maybe an abstracted uh, representation of some units, but generally speaking, it is a specific thing uh, most of the time. There are a few exceptions to that, which largely have to do with the French units involved and that they're sort of given this more arbitrary um, designation. But but generally speaking, it's, it's cool for that reason, that it, it very much hones in on some historical detail. Now, if you watch Justigard videos, I think he lays a very uh, genuine and, and valid criticism of the game that it can be very fiddly in terms of the way units are moved on and off the map how units withdraw during winter seasons and the like enlistments change over time. And it is for sure a little, uh, I don't know, clunky for that reason. I, I think that is a valid criticism of the game. However, um, I 
there's just something about the game, the game system, the way the scenarios are set up, the additional scenarios that are available that just make me really like the game in terms of what it's trying to achieve. And so um, that's why I'm just so very interested. I'm so very happy to get this onto the table and get to show you guys uh, a bit of, of what we're dealing with here. Now, a couple of things I'm going to throw out right away. Uh, these videos that I'm going to be doing are not going to be so good at how to play videos, honestly. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm choosing as the content creator to do what I want to do, um, I'm playing through scenarios in chronological order. So that's why we're playing King William's War and not, say, the French and Indian War or the American Revolution, though my plan is to eventually get to those. Um, I want to play through chronologically in terms of what scenarios are available for this game. So you're going to see some things that are not going to be, quote-unquote, normal for the game system because they're specialized scenarios that represent different things from the base game some of the time. Uh, and generally, I, I don't want to go through very detailed um, uh, exposition on the rules of the game other than making passing references to it. Because I, what I want you guys to, as you watch this, is to just enjoy the narrative of the game and kind of where things are going, the nuances of the rules. It's, you know, it's not a terribly complicated game, but I would recommend if you're watching this right now to not, and if you've purchased the game and you're like, hey, I want to play along, let me get my game out, just stop what you're doing, go look for the Minuteman rules. There are links on BoardGameGeek, there are links on the Consum World page. Please use the Minuteman rules, and if you can, try to find the latest version that is on the Google Doc, not just the static PDF, because the steward for the Minuteman rules, which are like the living rules at this point, um, because the original designer just doesn't have time to, to keep up with the game. He's got a very busy life. I think he's involved in local politics somewhere, wherever he lives. Um, it, it's sort of been now stewarded by the, the fan base of the game and the Minuteman rules have clarifications and refinements that make the game much easier to follow and understand how to use, but there are always little refinements being made along the way. I had some input on a minor revision recently just to help kind of clarify some things so that a, a, a user, a player of the game, does not get confused. So again, if just throwing it out there, check out the Minuteman rules. Definitely want to use that instead. Um, I printed off a copy and that, that's kind of the rule set I'll be using alongside, again, all the specialized rules for this scenario. Um, so let's talk about the scenarios for just a second. Um, I don't want this video to be a whole introduction to the game and game system, because what I really want this video to be is a recounting of King William's War. But I think it's worth just throwing out there that the base game includes scenarios that are uh, basically French and Indian War, uh, American Revolution, and King George's War. Uh, which lines up with sort of the, you know, War of Austrian succession time period, uh, generally. Um, but there are other scenarios available for the game. And I'm just going to, I'm going to throw a couple things on camera here to give you a passing reference of what some of that is. If you purchase the game today, you will, uh, from Compass, if it's still in stock, I can't be sure that, that, that it is. It very likely includes a little sheet of paper that says bonus scenario for Dunmore's War, which is sort of this sub-event within... The American Revolution. So it's like a little mini scenario with its own set of counters. All the scenarios that are in this game use <clears throat> tend to have some kind of uh, markings used in the upper left or right corners that help tell you that, hey, this unit is for a particular scenario. I separate all the counters out into bags for the scenarios now, so it's good to help have that helpful reminder. So you get this. You're also going to get a uh, errata counter sheet. It's a little tiny one that comes in and with this little pamphlet is basically some explanatory text about the things that were errata. So you should get this errata counter sheet. Uh, if you purchase the game secondhand, you may need to, uh, in, you may need to reach out to Compass and, and get a copy. There were also um, uh, several scenarios that were included in uh, a issue of um, uh, Shoot, I'm, I'm blanking. Uh, Paper Wars. And there's several scenarios here that are really, they're like variant scenarios, honestly. So you have like Chickasaw Wars is a, is, a, is a distinct one. You have variations of the American Revolution. Now what you're seeing here are photocopies that I made for myself so that I don't have to lug around 
the issue of paper wars. Uh, but you can see they're just they're just variations on the American Revolution scenario uh, used as sort of like what if this happened instead. Um, there's a few other things like extending the French and Indian War scenario to include Pontiac's rebellion. Um, so it was a Native American uh, uprising. Um, so you know you can you can get this the the issue of paper wars uh, included. Um, uh, included counters to go with this. And of course, I'm blanking on the issue of paper wars on camera, which is really dumb of me. I'm sorry. I will tell, I will put the issue of paper wars that you can get these additional scenarios in the video description. So at the very least, you'll be able to get that um, no problem. So, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that issue of paper wars is, is still in stock. So that should not be an issue for you guys to get. And then finally, um, the other thing I would throw out there is that if you go to Consim World, there is yet uh, another set of post-publication scenarios. It's titled uh, in the Consim World forum having like even more scenarios. And what you have in it, and this is just I printed it out: uh, Queen Anne's War, South, North, and a combined scenario of Queen Anne's War, which is basically the same time as the War of Spanish Succession. And then you have what we're playing, which is uh, King William's War, 1688 to 1697, uh, which again is, is basically taking place during the same time period as the Nine Years' War, um, or uh, War of the Grand Alliance, it might be called. And this is this is your fun opportunity to to enjoy uh, other games from Compass Games because there are some card-driven, uh, no peace without Spain system games on some of the European versions of this. And I did debate on playing this alongside of. Uh, nine years, uh, the War of the Grand Alliance game from Compass, but that just seemed like too much to be going on at one time. So I'm not doing that, but they, that's a fun idea to play the North American theater and the European theater of those wars at the same time. That'd be fun. Uh, two different games, of course, two different systems would be kind of wonky. Uh, anyway, so you can go out and download those scenarios. Now, the Queen Anne's War and the King William's War stuff, um, they have dedicated counters for them, but they are not uh, professionally printed. So what I did several years ago, and I'm really glad that I did this, and it's far enough in the in the past where I like I did this, and then I didn't play it, and it just sat in the box for a long time. Um, I printed the counter sheets on uh, Avery sticker paper, so I printed them out full color, uh, and then I took a bunch of spare counters, and I had I've collected, you know, many over the years. And I diligently cut out the sticker paper uh, and then very carefully with an X-Acto knife <clears throat> trimmed, trimmed the sticker paper counters, peeled off the back, and then applied them to spare counters. So it's like, this looks pretty good, right? Like, let me get the focus on it. Like, it looks good. Looks like a real counter, but it is, in fact, a manufactured counter that I made. It's a little easier to appreciate with, like, the units <clears throat> that have a front and a back. So you can see like this one, it doesn't, it's, it was a white spare counter. You can kind of see it doesn't 100% line up based on the cut that I did with the X-Acto knife. So it's a little, you know, it was a little off by a hair, but the counter works and it, you know, they, they look and play just fine. Um, so if you want to play this scenario, you have to put a little bit of work in. And in, in addition to the printed out counters, there's also something very interesting with this scenario, and, and we'll talk about the scenario specifics in a second, that uh, because it's representing, you know, almost 100 years before, you know, it's like 90 years before the American Revolution, um, North America is very different. And so the base game map um, divides things. You can see the terrain here between like, cultivated hexes, just sort of the yellow and orange, versus the wilderness, which is just this sort of foresty terrain type, and then these mountains, which are impassable, so they're they're like walls, you can't even enter them uh, in game terms. Well, this is earlier in time, so much of this cultivated area is still considered to be wilderness, and so I've used green bingo chips to kind of cover up the cultivated terrain to help us remember that when we're going through those hexes, we should be treating them as wilderness hexes, which will be 
higher uh, movement cost to move into them, and you'll also have more likelihood to have an ambush, uh, uh, nonlinear combat. Uh, in this game system, there's two types of combat. There's the ambush, nonlinear stuff, where you know your rangers, your uh, Native Americans are going to be using that combat type to ambush and, and defeat linear troops in the wilderness. And then there's linear combat, which is the more of the European style. Um, and, you know, how those two interplay are, are kind of interesting. So we, we got to watch out for that. Um, I will say as a Pennsylvania native, I'm a little disappointed that uh, if, if you weren't familiar with the geography of Pennsylvania, you would think maybe uh, Pennsylvania is flat because there's no mountains like they're showing these mountains up in uh, New York and Vermont and all those areas. But um, there, there are certainly, uh, you know, it's not flat. Pennsylvania is not a flat state uh, by any means. But in this game system, it's like, okay, well, yeah, there are valleys. So there's not enough. The, the mountains are not such that you have impassable terrain like are set up here further north where you're really sort of channeling movement uh, through these passes up to the Quebec area. Anyway, um, okay, so uh, that's a lot of basic preamble. Let's talk about the scenario itself because I think it just helps set the context for what we're doing here and because there's enough different things. I'm just going to be reading this uh, from the scenario information. So King William's War 1688 to 1697 was the North American, North American theater of the Nine Years' War. It was the first of four French and Indian wars fought between New France and New England along with their respective native allies. For King William's War, neither England nor France thought of weakening their position in Europe to support the war effort in North America. New France and the Wabanaki Confe uh, Confederacy were able to thwart New England expansion into Acadia. According to the terms of the Treaty of Ricewick, the boundaries and outposts of New France, New England, and New York remained substantially unchanged. However, the Great Peace of Montreal would end the long war between the French and the Iroquois and establish the Iroquois as a buffer between the French and the English. The scenario uses the North Map and begins on Turn 1, Spring 1688, and ends after Turn 57, Summer uh, 1697. Uh, now, here the scenario says use the American Revolution turn track and do a bunch of wacky craziness because the turn track is not long enough to accommodate the years of this conflict. So you can see this big, long turn track up here. I, I, I'm not doing that. I made my own turn track uh, in Excel that just makes it a little bit easier to actually track the years. So 1688, uh, 89, 90, 91, 92, and so on. I've got the reinforcements, the turn stuff all on here. Just easier for me to track than to try to do the, the logic that the scenario sets up, which asks you to wrap around the turn track and, and, and it just is kind of weird and wonky. This is much easier. So easy peasy stuff for me. Turn tracks can be tracked here. The setup has, as you can see, uh, several units out there. Now what's important to throw out is that most of the units that are on the board right now, and I'm just going to pick this one up as an example, are special units that defy convention of the normal rules. So this is, let me get the focus. There we go. So this is an example of one of the outpost militia units. So this unit is intended to represent a small outpost uh, in Falmouth and is not like a town. It is not even a very large unit of men. It is a basic like settlement uh, outpost garrison. It uh, And in terms of the... Uh, factors here. The factor on the left is linear combat factors. The factor in the middle is the ambush wilderness fighting factor uh, that it would use on defense. And then the third factor is movement. You can see it's a zero. So these units will not move. They simply exist in uh, the given location where they are set up. And so you can see there's some over here in New York, and then there's some Massachusetts near Boston, and then these areas uh, along the coast that were the primary outpost at the time. There is one over here that is right next to a French one, and it starts with a fortification marker, which helps defend it. There's also a fortification marker on Boston. Now, Boston exists here, uh, and it has this extremely strong uh, 
uh, militia unit, but you can see, uh, so it has 25 combat factors. Uh, the box, the black box around it means it's halved on attack. Um, it's got two wilderness defense and then it can't move. So it's like this really strong unit sitting in Boston. Um, and basically uh, with the fortification, it makes this a very tough nut to crack. I'm going to go ahead and tell you just because I've moved counters around with this scenario and have tried to kind of see how it all works. There's all, there, there's pretty much a 0% chance that the French are going to attack and take Boston. Uh, they just will never have enough combat factors for it to be reasonable that they would even succeed in attacking Boston. Um, now the French, by comparison, uh, are set up a little bit differently. We'll adjust the camera here so you guys can see. Um, these guys up here are the Native American units that are available to enter the scenario. I'm just putting them up there for, for ease of placement. Um, but the French have outposts similarly spread out. So we have uh, in what is, you know, really intended to be Fort Niagara. There's a militia with one uh, infantry unit out here. There's Fort Frontenac, or, you know, the outpost of Frontenac. Uh, then we have Montreal, uh, Three Rivers. I'm not going to say it in French because I can't speak French very well. And uh, Quebec. And then along the coast and near Nova Scotia, we've got one little outpost here, 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 uh, and then some up here. Important things, Halifax does not exist. Now, normally in this game, Halifax is very important to oversee supply tracing for the British. Uh, Halifax does not exist as a, as a cultivated port, so instead Boston is used as the primary overseas supply sort of anchor. Um, and then even areas up further north like Louisburg uh, are not established, so we've still got more of this sort of wilderness situation. An important hex is Port Royal here, um, later known as Annapolis. That's going to be important for the game. As we get into things, so you can just kind of see the overall situation with how the game is set up. Um, one important thing I, I should show is that one Native American unit is on the board, the Abenaki, and they are uh, here with a French leader. This is uh, Cast Castine. I'm not sure if that's how it's intended to be pronounced. So uh, you can see him there. Uh, basically, he's not going to add much to combat, which would be the first number. Uh, he's got a three seniority, so he's you know, reasonably in command of the French forces on the map. And then the fourth, uh, the four number, the third number, which is number four, uh, is his activation rating. So he's got a pretty good rating, which means he's going to be able to activate his stack reasonably often. In this game, that is an important thing. How do units activate? Um, most of the time, it's going to be with a leader. If you don't have a leader, but you want to move a stack, then you're going to treat it as if a leader was there with a campaign rating of two, which means you need to roll a two or less to activate. There are some modifiers that can change that. This guy's got a four, so on a D6, a four or less will mean he will activate. So he's actually pretty good, and he's going to be an important guy to use to actually move these Indians down and do uh, Native Americans down and do some raiding against these outposts. So... Um, there are a number of reinforcements that will come in over time. So there will be uh, Church, who, you know, if you go read up on the history of King William's War, you'll know that Church was kind of an important factor. He's treated as a ranger unit in this game. More leaders will come on, more units in the British fleet as sort of reinforcements will come on. The French in this scenario really don't have much in the way of reinforcements. So this is always going to be an uphill battle for the French uh, in this theater. It's just going to be the way it works. Um, to win this scenario, the British player uh, can win an immediate decisive victory if he simultaneously controls Quebec and Port Royal. So, here and here. The French player wins an immediate decisive victory the instant he controls Boston. I'm going to tell you that's not going to happen. It is much more likely and feasible for the British player to take Port Royal and Quebec than it would be for the French to take Boston. The, so in my mind, there's no way for for the French to uh, to win an automatic victory, but I think it's there for the British. Otherwise, you score one point for each outpost militia unit on the map at game's end. Again, these units, not that big unit uh, in Boston. 
it's not considered uh, an outpost for this rule. So all these other militia outposts um, count for victory points, basically. So um, I think I'd have to do a quick check. It's like, let me see, one, two, three, seven, nine, ten. I want to say there's ten on the board for the British right now, and then for the French, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. It looks like 13. If I'm just counting very quickly, I might have missed one somewhere. So just in terms of the overall victory points, the French are probably going to start with some initiative because they've actually got units on the board that can move, uh, where the British really do not. If you look, they're like the, the British turns are going to be waste. They can't do anything uh, uh, offensively until Church comes on. And he was sort of the guy who took the fight to the French to start with in this war. If you're interested, I, I actually think, I don't normally, I wouldn't normally recommend this, but if you look at the Wikipedia article for King William's War, you actually get a pretty good summary of how this war went. Um, and it's kind of an interesting opportunity to, to learn some stuff if you're not familiar. So you, you can use that as a pretty good reference, as a, as a summary version of what occurred here to understand the importance of church and how all the other guys that came in as reinforcements shifted this particular conflict. Same thing for the Queen Anne War scenario. Um so, so this scenario is really about uh, destroying, eliminating your opponent's outposts, and protecting your own. That is the basic strategic question of this scenario. Um, we talked about the civilized hexes. So, you know, these are covered up. Those are wilderness. Uh, ambush is permitted in these hexes. Ambush combat. Um, again, we talked about the French can't come down here. They're just not allowed to for game purposes. Uh, and then for... Uh, Native American recruitment, basically, uh, for the units that are available, there are three still available uh, for the French, five for the British. Uh, basically, at the beginning of each turn, you have the ability to try to recruit them. And, th and this is, in this scenario, which is very much simplified from the base game methodology of Indian recruitment, uh, you just need to roll a one. So it's a one in six chance of any of those units activating. And just so you understand how the Native American units work, um, Typically, once they've been involved in a combat, they go home. So, like, they're kind of a use once, and then you got to try to get them re-recruited again. There's a couple of exceptions to that. But just generally speaking, you can expect to probably get, like, one good ambush combat out of them uh, before they, they go back home, and then you got to kind of bring them back. There's a special rule in this scenario that uh, when this leader is at the Abenaki village, which is this sort of orange symbol here uh that is a uh looks like a pen quill and a quill pen and a maybe an axe um i'm not sure if i'm looking at that correctly if he is there and he's there right now but the unit's already available the abenaki can be automatically recruited so the so the french are going to have a reasonable ability to get this stack operating every turn to do stuff um in terms of replacements, uh, besides the reinforcements that come in based on the turn, the French may replace one uh, Mar de, de Quoi step each spring turn in Montreal and in Quebec. So the French have a little bit of ability to put some colonial units back onto the board if they lose any. Uh, so that's useful. And then in terms of the fleets, um, they, they basically, for the first dozen turns, Fleets won't matter, but then the fleets will start to come on. And in this scenario, the fleets are really important for uh, amphibious landing invasion. So moving troops from like here up to here, right? That's one good use of them. They're also good for cutting off overseas supplies. So that will become an important thing uh, over time. And then finally, I think we talked about the forts. I think that's it. So we can get started, guys. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm, I'm going to run through this very fast. We're not going to play through every movement in turn. Um, I'll probably show things very briefly as we go, uh, because what we've been talking about this game for 30, 30 minutes already. Oh my gosh. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do cuts every year. So this game, uh, this scenario runs, let's see, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten years, and 50, you know, basically 57 turns. Some of the turns would go very fast because basically, you, you know, you take your actions in your turn 
you're going to be activating the unit. Now, like this 57 turn game is very, very long. It's longer than even like the American Revolution, but the number of units is very small. So those turns go very fast. There will be some turns where almost nothing is going to happen, especially in the early phases. Um, so this is like, it, it's long in terms of turns, but it's short in terms of activity and it'll play pretty quick. So basically every spring, before the spring turn of each new year, uh, we'll talk about the game position and the game situation. Um, just to throw out there that we start on the spring of 1688. There is always this winter turn um, before spring, but I'm, I'm not going to talk through that. Something to keep in mind, every second winter, which just because of the way I structured my Excel sheet, it's showing like this. This winter, each of these winter turns is considered the second winter turn because you have the preceding one before the next one. Um, units with an E on them in the upper right, that boxed E, uh, that means that they're enlistments. And so every second winter turn, um, you know, there's basically, basically there's a cadence where those units go home for the winter. You know, they take care of their crops, they celebrate Christmas, whatever, and then they can come back. So, it, and this is a realistic portrayal of the fact that, like, these are not, most of these units that are engaged, like, they're not British regulars. They they are provincials that have other responsibilities, so they're not going on grand campaigns in the wilderness. They're serving for, for some months, they're doing their thing, and then they're going home, and they can come back, but they've got responsibilities to attend to. And I know that there there's some, you know, there's a couple of folks out there on the forums that have been unhappy with, like, hey, I can't. I can't get up, you know, I can't get up here and then they all go home and it, you know, this weird situation. Well, that's just the reality of, of the war that, that you could not, you were not operating with sufficient uh, regulars to have a lot of holding power uh, on your campaigns. So it's going to be very skirmishy, uh, what units you use are largely ephemeral. But I like that as we go through the chronology of these scenarios that, that begins to change. You start to see North America become a little more uh, cultivated uh, in terms of European settlements and the ability to, to put larger and larger forces uh, onto the map to conduct warfare. So we'll, we'll see that as we go through you know, King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, uh, the French and Indian War, and then of course the American uh, Revolution itself. So uh, let me put a cut here, guys, and we will show the results of uh, the spring of 1688 to the beginning of spring 1689. Very quickly, uh, before I actually start playing, just to give you guys a frame of reference so that, you know, when I do chime in and, and talk about what happened each year, you understand the general flow of the game. This is the sequence of play. Um, and so we would do a naval phase first, every turn where we check to see if there are fleet uh, availability, but that's not really going to be relevant until much later in the scenario. Then we have a reinforcement phase. Again, you know, we won't have reinforcements until 1689. Uh, and then we would do the Indian recruitment, which again, each side is basically going to have a, a chance for each available unit up here uh, to roll a die. And if they get a one, they can place that unit on the village location on the map that it is associated with. So we'll do that every turn, which means that, you know, between now and the next showing for 1689, we will have had um, several opportunities to have recruited those guys uh, over the course of the given year, because uh, it's every turn. And then uh, we would have the potential for some uh, replacements, which won't really be relevant here too much. Um, and then we have the actual operations phase with the British player always going first. And then the other player, you know, whether it's French, American, or Spanish, or whatever, going after that. And basically, you're going through the process of selecting a stack or the leader, uh, rolling a die to activate. Um, again, if you don't have a leader there, if you need a two or less. There are a few special units that have a plus after their movement uh value, like Church here, he can activate no matter what, basically. Um, he will always get to activate. So there are going to be cases where specialized one-off units have the special ability to just always activate 
They tend to be, uh, you know, meant to be commanded by people who are either very aggressive or were these smaller units that were always kind of doing something um, rather than, you know, having a, we'll say, uh, passive leader and uh, unwilling to do a lot of stuff. Um, and what's important about that, just uh, again, as a frame of reference is, if you're trying to move around, you say, well, there's only a two and six chance that like this guy up here, just some random French unit, can move on any given turn, right? If you're given, say, six turns, on average, you're only going to have activated that unit twice. And the movement points that they have, right, you can start to figure out, like, what does that start to look like? in your operational capability where um, you're not going to be able to get super far all the time with units that can't go very far. And this matters a lot for supply, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, basically, you, you run through this. There's a potential for reaction militia placement. That's not going to be relevant for this scenario. Um, so there's a few things related to reaction. Uh, there is combat, so you always have to pay five movement com uh, five movement points for combat, um, and then you go through sort of the combat segment there, and then you just do that for each leader, and when you get to the end of your turn, you can do a few other cleanup actions. Uh, then the other player gets to do the same, then you look at scheduled withdrawals, if there are any other special reinforcements that may apply, and on each spring and fall turn, normal militia units are withdrawn. Um, and then you have a winter attrition phase on winter turns. Now, there are only, you know, per year, there's basically two winter turns. There's a winter turn at the start of the year, there's a winter turn at the end of the year. <clears throat> and usually on that second winter turn um, that you're uh, heading into, you're going to have, uh, you know, enlistments going away, but then you also have to trace supply. Now, um, I just want to cover this very quickly. Typically, your units are going to be able to trace overseas supply, which means that they're going to count from the unit along roads or rivers to a port that is on a sea area. And then assuming that sea area does not have an enemy fleet in it, you can get overseas supply. So generally speaking, um, as long as you have some capability to trace that supply back to, say, for the French. They could be down here. They can trace along Lake Champlain, this river system, back to Quebec and be an overseas supply. And that is the main sort of important highway of supply. You only check supply in the winter turns, but again, because of the possibility of low activations, you want to be very careful sending units very far from where they could trace overseas supply because they might not be able to get back into a supply trace in time for winter. And that's a big part of the strategic element of this game. Um, <clears throat> so for here along the coast, most units will very routinely be in and stay in supply. But once you're out here in the wilderness, uh, it's really going to depend on are you on a, a river line that can go back to friendly territory? Uh, are you stuck elsewhere? Are you not able to activate? And this makes it uh, even more important to look at, you know, if you're operating uh, down here where, um, let's say you're, you know, you're a French unit sitting here, well, you're not going to be able to trace supply down this way, potentially, uh, into Connecticut uh, and large parts of New York just because of enemy units there. So like sitting here, is actually very dangerous. You want to be sitting up here so you can trace supply up and out. So it's going to be, you know, what what you would see is the potential for units to come south, maybe be stopping here and wintering along Lake Champlain because they can get supply through here. But anything that they do, like leaving here in the spring, destroy some outposts, return up to here before winter, is going to be the cadence that we're going to follow for a large part of this game for the French. The British will be a little bit different because they're going to tend to have a little bit better capability to operate along the coasts to hurt the French because, as you can see, a lot of these French outposts are uh, on a sea zone where the British will very likely 
be able to be in supply much of the time. So that is a big part of the game, and it's one of the things you have to be careful looking at the winter turns as they come up, uh, because if you are out of supply on a winter turn, you take a step loss, and even if you have a two-step unit, and some of these units on the board uh, are two-step units, like this French unit, if you're out of supply two turns in a row, that unit's just gone, right? And even, I mean, even being reduced by one step puts it in a very dangerous position. So that's the basic cadence of the game. Um, so as we play through, what you guys aren't going to necessarily see me do on camera is we'll be activating this unit with, like, the, the Native Americans. They're going to come down uh, and stop, and then the next turn they're going to start to raid. Um, Indian units, Native American units, uh, are always in supply, so that's one special thing for them. If we were to start to grab some of these French provincials and bring them down, uh, we would just have to be very careful what they could do, and, and they're going to move much more methodically and carefully because they need to be able to always trace that supply, and if they get cut off, then that's going to be a big major problem. And on turn nine, when the British get church, that's when they're going to have a lot more leeway to counteract the French. So for at least the first nine turns of the game, and really for many turns after that, the French want to do as much damage to these outposts as they can as, as, as possible. Um, if a player has an outpost that is destroyed in this scenario, they can rebuild it, but it takes them being in the hex where the outpost is supposed to go and spending 10 movement points to replacement to replace it, which is effectively like, you know, going to be a lot of that unit's movement for a given turn to try to restore that. So there's going to be sort of a back and forth tug of war of destroying uh, outposts and then trying to rebuild outposts, all kind of fighting through here and then eventually the British capability to start striking up here. Okay, here we are at the spring of 1689. And just to recap quickly, um, you know, again, these turns went very, very fast. Uh, largely because uh, most units that are mobile on the map uh, have to use the default leader, which is only a two campaign rating, all except for the French leader on the board. So what had happened was uh, that leader had brought uh, the Abenaki down, moved along the coast. They could not attack uh, this fortification uh, because a fortification, rather than just an outpost by itself, cannot be ambushed, and the Native American unit was the only one that that leader had, so they could not have assaulted, and if you look at the history, this stuck around for a little while. Because of that, we would need to pull down some of these provincials, and I may end up doing that over time. Um, but he did come over, and he removed the uh, Falmouth uh, outpost. So that is one outpost destroyed. Um, now, what happens with a Native American unit is if you get a result, even on an ambush uh, combat, other than a zero result, and we rolled enough to do a one-step loss, eliminating that outpost, uh, that Native American unit goes back to the uh, available box. And then what we ended up doing was uh, redeploying the leader, because the leader stuck around, uh, to uh, the other... Uh, the Micmac uh, Native Americans, which we did successfully roll for over the last few turns, and they were starting to, to travel down, uh, and now the leader is with them to kind of keep them moving. He may take a side trip to get the Abenaki back automatically as part of that leader's special, special role. But, uh, you know, so it may sound like the British aren't able to do much, right? They don't have any units on the board except... Out of their set of five Native Americans, we were able to get both the uh, the Mohawk in and the Cayuga in, uh, though they're only moving, again, on the default leader activations, which has been pretty slow. Uh, these guys got up to this location here, right adjacent to front, uh, Fort Frontenac, but nearby, opposing them, are... The, uh, let's see if I can, yeah, the Ottawa Native American uh, that are allied with the French. The French were actually able to roll well enough to get them in to uh, engagement, and they, are, they came through the river to get over to here. So it's really a, a tight race to see who can get where, um, because it is conceivable that the Mohawk could 
take out this uh, outpost, uh, and but there's a decent enough strength here that they may not be able to do it. So you st start to see, you know, the Indian unit raiding uh, out here, and we could even send the Cayuga out towards Fort Niagara potentially, but given that there are provincials stationed there with the outpost, they are not as lightly defended as many of these British outposts are. Um, so it's definitely a bummer that the French leader, you know, loses the Native American unit for a while when he successfully takes something, which sort of brings into that like, oh, well, it would have been nice to have, you know, some of these units. I've been trying to get these guys to activate with the default leader, but I'm rolling very poorly, so they're just not able to do it. Um, so that's it for the first year of the war, which, I mean, I think the cadence is about on par with the history where that French leader did uh, disrupt some outposts, and now he's busy trying to corral uh, and get some other uh, Native American tribes set up to continue to do that raiding. Um, British-aligned tribes also uh, seeing some activity. But again, because of the low activation ratings for everything on the board, we are going, in some cases, turns without there actually being activity. And this is just, I mean, I think one could look at this and say, oh, that's really boring. I think the current cadence of this scenario and this historical conflict, all that's kind of par for course, like it's it's accurate. We would see in like the American Revolution scenarios, leaders with much better ratings and more consistent activations leading to certain things. But you gotta keep that in mind, you know, if you're just looking to activate any old random stack, uh, they need, you know, they only have a one in three chance of activating if that, and in winter turns, which we had a couple winter turns, uh, that may mean they don't activate at all because on winter turns, campaign ratings are reduced by two. So any stack that does not have a leader uh, with a three or better uh, basically can't activate at all on winter turns. So we've definitely seen, you know, this is, this is the slow crawl cadence of the scenario uh, but it matches the sort of historical thing. We don't have a lot of infrastructure for grand campaigns here, and it's only just starting before the British crown, you know, it, it sort of mobilizes greater response to the French raids. One thing I'm going to call out, I, I did something dumb earlier, and I don't know why I, I didn't under, like, I just screwed up. When they say second winter turn in a year, they do mean this column. So I, for some reason, I had a brain fart and I wrote it down wrong. It's over here. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Um, that will be important for church and other units with that E designation I mentioned before. So that's where things stand at spring 1689. We technically had a winter turn in 1689 already, but the spring tends to be a good place to show what's about to occur since everything has a much greater chance of activating. The uh, French outpost still in pretty good safe shape. But we'll start to see that morph over time uh, as the British get more units. So um, we'll see you back here for spring 1690. Okay, here we are at the spring of 1690. And, and several things have occurred that are pretty significant. And I think it's worth uh, talking through the importance of a lot of these game systems uh, that, that End of Empire has that makes it so very interesting to play through. And the neat little strategic puzzles that present themselves. Um, it, it, for, for as slow as this scenario might seem to be, 1689 was a very interesting year uh, for several reasons. Um, and of course, you know, with the beginning of the spring turn, I've already put a lot of the reinforcements and stuff on the board. I uh, did the Native American reinforcement and everything else. But just, I want to quickly talk about what's happened here. Um, the most significant thing is uh, early in earlier in the year, I had activated these two units that were in Montreal and had them start marching down Lake Champlain. And when we got the Frontenac leader uh, into Quebec, we eventually did a leader redeployment. So that's something you can do if a leader didn't activate. You can move him, you know, to a space with a hex with allied units, and he can take control of them for the next turn. And so he he did when they were down here, and during the winter turns. Uh, he was able to activate them. Now, the winter turn, I think I mentioned this before, you take up a, a minus two to the campaign rating of a leader uh, for winter turns. It's very hard to get units in winter to move. But amazingly enough, this guy did. And he had been able to, over the course of a couple of turns and activations, uh, destroy the two outposts that were in New York 
and decided to go ahead and squat in Albany after all is said and done for a couple of reasons. One, there is a unit that is supposed to enter that unit here, uh, Schuler, but he's not going to be able to enter this turn because this unit is, uh, because we're occupying Albany. So he's supposed to go into Albany. Um, and there is a case where you can have a unit, like, if the enemy controls the entry hex, they show up and they cause a combat. But based on, uh, I need to double check the reference here. I'm reasonably confident that unit is not that way. If the turn is boxed, the unit arrives even if their entry hex is enemy occupied, which it, it Schuler's is not boxed. So by uh, Frontenac sitting here on Albany, he basically makes it so that uh, that reinforcing regiment uh, commanded by Schuler uh, doesn't show up and is delayed. And it will remain delayed until uh, the, uh, the French leave the hex, I guess, is kind of the, the thing now. I don't think these units can stay here indefinitely, but it is good to delay the British to some degree. Um, now, these guys are still in supply because they can trace this river line up to here. There's uh, a carry uh, assumed here so that the river trace line can go up over to here, then along Lake Champlain up to uh, St. Lawrence River and up to Quebec for overseas supply. So... For the whole of the winters, while these guys were operating, they were operating over the rivers and stayed in supply. So that is now three outposts for the British uh, eliminated currently. Now, uh, the British have lucked out in that they have a number of their Native American units on the board. In fact, they have four of their five, and they're all kind of clustered out here. Now, because they're using the default later, they couldn't move during winter. Um, but... Probably the more uh, significant thing that was uh, occurring out here is that there was a combat between uh, what was, I think it was the Mohawk, and they came back actually, the British got really lucky, uh, versus the uh, Ottawa Indians. And basically, the, the way that the combats work out is if there's any sort of combat result from an ambush combat, the Native Americans go away. And so while the... Uh, Mohawk Indians could not necessarily expect to, for sure, um, survive. They could at least remove the, uh, the French commanded Native Americans. And then these other guys, you know, it's about, a, it's about the competing composition of forces and who can outnumber what and what is the position. So, I mean, it was basically such that, um, these guys were kind of like out here, and they attacked, and the way that this system works is that if both sides have an ambush factor with a plus symbol, that means they they can both attack on ambush. And if you're the defender, uh, you know, the attacker has a plus number and the defender has a plus number, the defender is the one that still conducts the ambush in that case. And so these units eliminated the Mohawk, but then had to leave themselves because when Native American units inflict any sort of combat result on an ambush, they go back to the available box. So it was, you know, tactically a French, you know, Native American allied victory, but it had opened up this space for British-led or British-allied Native Americans to kind of overwhelm their, with force. Uh, unfortunately, those units, you know, these other uh, tribes didn't activate and couldn't do a whole lot. Um, but but they do have a lot more free reign here now, though the French did just activate the Huron uh, tribe. The, the main thing I would just call out is like these guys have a great capability to maybe move out this way and cut these guys out of supply this year. And that would be a, a pretty bad situation. If these guys had not entered, we wouldn't have to worry. These guys could stay down here, you know, for a while and maybe even run around over here and then head back because Frontenac's a pretty good leader with a four campaign rating. But they have to watch their sort of western flank here because 
And if these guys activate, they can travel along the rivers, they can get in behind, they can cut off supply for the next winter. Um, so that's pretty significant. Now, the, the thing with this game system, why I think it's so interesting, the combat and between the ambush and the linear combat, is that you might say, well, why don't these guys come up and attack these locations? Well, that's certainly an option. However, um, there, there are... Uh, the force composition of those French units make, makes it very difficult to entertain the idea. So, um, I, again, this is I really like this system for the way this all works out. Generally speaking, and, and we'll just use this uh, Mohawk Indian as, a, as the example, that first number is the linear combat. So they can't really fight in linear combat, but they have a two ambush factor and they can attack on ambush normal movement, right? That's, that's pretty good. So if you're ever... If you're fighting against units that have no ambush factors, then yeah, those Native American units are are awesome. They're great. I mean, even if you only get to use them, they do some damage and they go away. They're really great, you know, units for that. However, um, you know, likewise, if you're if you're dealing with like a unit that is all linear factors and very limited ambush factors, that unit is fine for linear combat. Um, and if you can catch Native Americans in a situation where they can't ambush, um, then they are going to, you know, defeat the Native Americans. The French units in this scenario and several other scenarios before the American Revolution uh, are set up to reflect the greater sort of frontier integration uh, in, in um, combat style that the French uh, were able to leverage. So you had, <coughs> excuse me, sort of the colonial provincial French that also had some frontier experience um, learned from Native Americans and just living uh, out there. And I'm, I'm not sure if I would go as far to, to be able to describe some of these units as Coeur de Bois, uh, which are sort of the, the name for uh, the, the frontiers Frenchmen who had intermarried with Native Americans and all this, all this stuff. It's really fascinating history. But, but the units that are on the board do reflect a mixed component of, of units and capability. So even just looking at this unit that would be defending uh, along the river there, you can see they have a linear combat factor. That circle means they can't attack. Um, so they're really only good for defense, but they at least have a one defense factor. Uh, and so they can defend. And then they have a one ambush factor, and that plus is super duper important. So this regiment, um, or I'm sorry, this battalion, because uh, it's a two dots so of battalion unit, is actually extremely potent in defending this outpost. And there's a similar unit over here. There's uh, a unit over in Quebec that's similar. And then if we look at these units that Frontenac has in Albany right now, they have a two linear factor. That box means they're halved on attack. But they have a two ambush and a plus as well. So, so what that ultimately means in terms of the operational tempo of this game is that so long as these French units are on the defense uh, from a Native American attack, they will get to ambush first. So again, if, if both units have a plus, the defending unit will be the one that does the ambush combat and deals damage or potentially deals damage on the die roll. If they react meaning like interception, if you're playing any other sort of game that is maneuver-based. If they react and intercept into a hex, that unit is still the defender. So if these guys were marching up, marching up, marching up, came to here, this unit could potentially intercept into here, ambush this unit, possibly eliminate it before it can even do anything. And even if it doesn't, if it's a no result, these guys don't disappear like a Native American unit does, uh often for combat results, but, you know, either way, when the ambush combat is done, then there's linear combat, and these guys would still be eliminated. So it almost makes it that these Native American units cannot expect to take these outposts at all, so long as these units with both a plus ambush factor and a linear combat factor are sitting outside the outposts. They simply cannot do it. Um, they, they they can try to do something. They could try to bait them to come out, and then these guys would be the defenders. But the French have no reason to try to do that. The one exception would be if these guys tried to come up and cut the supply line by sitting on these rivers. And that is kind of the one thing that these 
Native American units can attempt to do. And if they can do that, um, then it maybe it makes it a little more difficult. The one exception I'll throw out there is that due to the garrison outpost supply, one unit with an outpost, and these are considered outposts, can be supplied. Um, so based on how I interpret the rules, even if they cut off supply, the, these spots are enough to supply each of those units. At least that's my reading of the rules. Someone could interpret that differently, but that's how I see it. So, so there's this whole thing where like, yeah, we've got these Native American units, but they're currently not enough to have a reasonable expectation to take out these outposts. But what they're really good for is going to be to head east and defend this frontier, defend it from French encroachment, come over here to try to keep the French from coming down into New York. Um, and then, you know, it, the, the one danger, of course, is if the Huron or the uh, Ottawa uh, French-aligned tribes come down south and capture the villages, then these guys get removed. So if they all came over here to block, that opens up the possibility that some of those guys could come down and disrupt their villages. So there's this whole little, you know, where do you, where can you go? What do you do with those units? Um, because while they are potent individually and they have pretty good ambush ratings, they cannot sustain, you know, they can't take on a properly mixed, uh, composition force like these French battalions are uh, effectively. They, they will be, um, there's enough, you know, skirmish, scouting, uh, wilderness warfare expertise that they can't just ambush at will. And then, you know, their ability to sustain a protracted engagement is nil. Um, so anyway, I'm going to talk to a couple other things very quickly. Just uh, the French leader now commands uh, both a uh, standard unit with some linear factors and one of these Native American units and can potentially try to take this fortified outpost. I think it's tough going and really it might have been better to have sent those units that were here down here rather than take the New York uh, Albany uh, outpost. But he's still threatening to move in church uh had come into the game and he had sat here but didn't have enough movement points to rebuild the outpost so you can rebuild destroyed outposts by spending 10 movement points he did not have enough movement points to do this and then he had to go back home uh, because he's an e entry unit which means uh he's removed every second winter turn and he comes back in so 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 far there's a very you know uh not enough has happened here but the french hold the advantage broadly speaking, and now the Abenaki are coming back in, um, which could further shift things. Um, but but in order to take this fortification, we need units with linear combat factors, which is what the French are trying to put together so they can actually try to assault and take this, or alternatively, they could head west and try to disrupt more of these outposts. The other important thing uh, that I should call out are the reinforcements, um, so let me think through that for a second. Okay, the, the important thing with the reinforcements this turn, and, I, and I'm calling this out special just because this is like the turn with the most reinforcement things. So we had Schuler who couldn't come in here. We do have Winthrop uh, who comes in to uh, Hartford, Connecticut. So I had to remove my, uh, my blocker piece of paper from Connecticut because this guy is going to be able to move out of here. So the French can't come down here that these guys can come out. Now, I'm not sure what they're going to do. This guy is more of a linear combat unit, provincial, um, with a two linear combat and a one defense for ambush. So if he's out stomping around the wilderness, he's more likely to be ambushed. So I think it may be more important to try to, I don't know, get into here to defend, maybe figure out some way to come over here and push the French out of this space. It'd be very hard to do that. Um, the other ones were, of course, uh, because it's spring, uh, Church is back, and I want to call attention to the fact that Church is a ranger. That R, he's a ranger unit. He's potent. He can activate every turn all the time. Very good unit. Uh, but he does go home uh, during the uh, end of the year, and he comes back in spring. Um so he is back, 
And then we also got this uh, unit uh, led by uh, foot. Um, so five linear combat, two ambush, but not on the attack. Uh, and then we have Phipps as a leader. And he's not as good as the French leaders. He only activates on a three or less and will be very unlikely to move in the winter. But uh, he comes into Boston. Um, the other important thing is the British fleet is available, and it is available automatically by special uh, scenario rules from now through turn 16, and then uh, into next year, there'll basically be like a 50% chance of the fleet being available every turn. But this guy is available, and we put him into the Gulf of Maine at the moment. So what we can do now, because there is a fleet available, is use an amphibious invasion. So in the rules of this game, you must have a fleet in the sea zone, sea area adjacent to your destination for a naval invasion. Uh, you don't, you know, you only have one fleet at a time. You don't need to be in every intervening sea area, but it has to be in the destination. Uh, because this map is smaller and we're only dealing with so many things, it makes it kind of easy. We could alternatively uh, put the fleet in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and then have an invasion of Quebec, which we'll want to do at some point. But I think for now, we try to have a little bit more, uh, uh, less dramatic actions right now. Um, so we can put him here, and then what that'll mean is we could activate a force to do a naval invasion and plop them somewhere else on the sea zone, uh, sea area. And I think the most advantageous thing to try this year is to send church via naval invasion and come up here to take Annapolis or Port Royal. And the important thing is once he's up there, we can actually spend movement points once we've destroyed this uh, outpost. On the flip side is the Annapolis outpost. So this is the only, I'm pretty sure this is the only outpost for this scenario that if you remove it, you can uh, replace it with the British version of the outpost. So that allows us to take Port Royal, Annapolis, uh, put our own outpost there, and it's like a more permanent garrison, and then we can send Church elsewhere. Um, church is so very important because he can activate all the time. Uh, he doesn't need to roll. He's an automatic uh, activation unit because he has a plus after his 20 movement points. So we can use Church to great effect. He was really critically important to the British operations. Um, so either, you know, we could use FIPS to try to contest what these guys are doing, um, though I think they kind of need, I think they ideally need some more forces because this guy's going to be very susceptible to being ambushed probably. Um, but at the very least we, we can do that. Alternatively, what we could do is we could try to activate FIPS to do it. Um, and that might make a little more sense because we need church to be doing ambush activities along here where Phipps is basically has no other use. So maybe that's what we'll do is try to use Phipps to take Annapolis. I'm not sure. I think historically it was Church that went over there and did some raiding, but uh, I can't I can't recall. The thing we'll have to be careful of is even once we take it, you have these other areas. You have uh, a Native American tribe over here that could be uh, an issue. So we're going to be operating in that space. So uh, there you go, guys. Um, next turn, Schuler could try to come in. And then also in the later summer turn, the British will get additional reinforcements uh, with more linear uh, Massachusetts um, provincials. So uh, a lot, you know, two regiments, they're pretty strong compared to all the other units on the board. Those guys will come in in summer um, and we'll see what happens. So um, I'll go play through this year and then we'll come back in the spring of 1691 and show how the game has changed. Hey guys, uh, 1690 has proven to be an, a momentous year in the war and could even be seen as a year of miracles for the French as they nearly lost the whole game but managed to get just lucky enough to stabilize the situation and now has put them in a very advantageous position for the rest of the game. Uh, though, you know, how this shakes out to, you know, the end of victory, we'll, we'll see. Um, so many interesting considerations and how the rules will kind of con come together to reflect stuff. Um, one thing I'm just going to throw out there, I don't think I mentioned it earlier, uh, there are hexes on the map 
that are uh, supply hexes. They're noted with these barrels. When you're playing the normal game without the extra wilderness that this scenario adds in, um, those are supply sources. So on French and Indian War scenarios and like earlier, you know, basically pre-American Revolution, the British can use these supply hexes for supply. Um, but if you look at the map, basically there's like an unwritten convention that is these supply hexes are always in cultivated terrain. So one of the things, and I should have mentioned this earlier in the video, I, I'm house ruling, is that since these hexes, like this one and this one in particular, are wilderness, they're not cultivated enough to serve as supply hexes. So I am ignoring them for supply purposes. So just an FYI, now that I've remembered to talk about this, I'm, I'm talking about it, so just keep that in mind. That's not part of the scenario rules. I feel like it's an omission of, in, like an inconvenient omission and uh, that should probably be in there because it does not make sense for a supply hex to be wilderness. Um, th there is no other hex, I think, on the map anywhere in a normal scenario uh, that has a supply hex in the wilderness. There are entry hexes in the wilderness, but that is a different different mechanic. Supply, specifically, is always in cultivated hexes, so I do not count this as supply, neither do I count this hex up here, which has a supply marker. I don't count that as a supply source. So just Something to watch out for. I'm, I'm, that's how I choose to interpret this game situation. You, you may think differently, and that may affect how you play your game compared to how I'm playing it. But you know, I've I've played other games around this time frame via like AG Odds PC games, and just like my general feel and understanding of the era that seems to match with my expectations. So anyway, what were the big things that happened? Well, um, you know, we have seen via the introduction of. Uh, Phipps and some reinforcements into Boston, a success, successful capture of Port Royal and the replacement of the outpost with a British outpost in Annapolis. So that's sort of a, a major victory for the British. That is part, that is one half of the automated uh, automatic victory conditions. Um, the only problem was that they had taken a step loss on this regiment. Um, and when this regiment takes a step loss, it can no longer attack. So what I opted to do was to leave this unit here as a holding force, and then Phipps was eventually redeployed back to Boston to pick up these two uh, regiments that are set to be withdrawn this turn. Of course, they're in the dead pile, which I'll explain why in a moment, but um, and the, the important thing is, like, it's either use them or lose them. They get withdrawn on turn 19, spring, of 1691. So you have to make use of them, these two Massachusetts regiments. You have to do something with them. So my plan was for Phipps to do a, a naval invasion of Quebec. Um, and if you read the history, this is actually what they tried to do. I'm not sure the exact timing works out this way, but it, it, I tried it. So we had then moved the British fleet on a separate turn to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which was let me get that on camera so you can see a little bit better. So we had fleet up here, which, you know, feeds into here, obviously. Um, and we tried a naval invasion. Now, here's the thing. I knew that this was a risky gambit, but it was basically going to be a game-winning move, so we should try it, right? If we, if we don't use those units for anything, they just go away. A wasted opportunity. So Phipps grabbed those guys. They went in. There was uh, one unit you know, this guy basically was there and he could ambush them as they landed. And so he did, but he rolled poorly and only did two step losses, which caused one of these units to be eliminated. That was fine, ultimately, uh, because uh, that, that, you know, that they could survive the ambush. They lucked out. That was exactly what they needed to get. I knew that ambush was going to occur, but the point was to try to survive it. And then win the battles afterwards in the proceeding linear combat, because there was still a one strength there, uh, it was something like a five to one linear combat roll, but we rolled poorly on that, and that was the critical die roll. We eliminated the French unit, but we took a step, step loss ourselves, which left Phipps up there with a reduced unit that could no longer attack, could only sit in outside of Quebec. Now, the nice thing in that moment was that they were blocking the supply. So the fleet was blocking supply. 
but even if the fleet leaves, if Phipps could hold the position, he was putting basically uh, overseas supply out of commission for the French, which would dramatically affect their ability to operate. It wouldn't totally eliminate it because, again, you can get supply for one unit in a in a garrisoned location um, or like, you know, in the hex with the outpost. But basically the... Uh, the big stacks could not maneuver because they would not have supply in the winter. Um, so during the winter turns, and this was this happened in fall, right before winter, which is going to put everything in the French realm under very uh, deep concern uh, in terms of operation. Um, effectively, it needed uh, Frontenac to attack, and I amazingly I rolled a one. I needed a two or a one to activate him. He was back here. Uh, after his retreat up, <laughs> basically what had happened, I should mention, is that the Native Americans had swarmed through here, basically cut off his supply, and he had marched uh, how he could back home over several turns because his supply situation was untenable. Frontenac had retreated through the valleys up to here, and then in the winter, he made a winter attack to uh, sort of relieve Quebec, and he succeeded in eliminating the last unit, and now Phipps is considered a prisoner of war, uh, in fact, because uh, he lost that combat, and, uh, you know, his whole his whole crew of units were eliminated, um, and they captured him in an ambush, and so uh, he is presently captured. Uh, he can be exchanged if the British ever capture a French leader, but I'm not sure when that, or if that's going to happen, so that was a major, like, it all the right things shook out. I mean, the British nearly had it, but they failed in the final combat that would have allowed them to continue to besiege uh, besiege the... If they had just rolled a little bit better, um, they probably would have you know, been able to win the game uh, or at least have the opportunity to siege Quebec one more time, uh, do a combat against the fortified outpost, and win a victory. I had, over time, managed to get a fortification marker on Quebec, but... Um, so with all that, uh, what ended up happening anyway is that winter attrition still occurred, and because those units were not in Quebec, uh, and the British fleet was over here through the winter, basically, at the end of fall, uh, you, you retain the marker there to show a blockade, um, the French actually uh, attrited away some of these units that they had used to liberate Quebec. They just, you know, exposure, however you want to look at it, they died. Um, and now in the spring turn, uh, turn 19, we we're able to get one uh, replacement. You know, one unit basically came back. So we still have one off the board that we'll have to wait till next turn um, or next spring even. Uh, or I guess, well, let me see here. They replace one Mar Marine de Quebec. Each step each spring turn in Montreal and in in so we could I'm trying to make sure I'm say we reduce them this spring we get one here which I've already placed and then we could actually uh, oh no um, this was the an original ambushing I'm sorry I stepped away guys for a little while before I could record again um, and so. This guy was replaced. This guy was replaced. There is still one uh, one step French unit that we'll have to wait till next spring to restore, um, and then they'll be able to operate. But it's basically like this whole kind of thing where the, the war was nearly lost in 1690 for the French, but they managed to turn it around. The important thing is uh, Phipps is like the main British leader besides Church involved in this scenario, and without him on the board the British are going to have a very hard time uh, operating without a leader. So uh, at the end of this turn, we are also going to have withdrawals. So these units that were destroyed, they would have been lost anyway. We're going to lose foot at the end of this turn when the withdrawals occur. And then we're basically going to be relying for the rest of the scenario on Church down here. Um, we're also going to lose Winthrop, and he ended up never leaving his starting hex because he could never activate. So we're going to lose him. We did get uh, this uh, India Company unit battalion, I think is what this unit is. 
it's not a very strong unit, and it's only a linear combat unit. So it could move around with Schuler, but Schuler and Church are both those types that are going to return home every winter. So, so the overall uh, operational ability for the British to, to, to do much is limited, but the French still have plenty here. And the, one of the things that they're going to have to watch out for, uh, because the French came down and took out the outpost here again, is this leader is still active. We still have Frontenac. Uh, we still have plenty of units that can operate. The one thing that's going to keep, uh, that's going to continue to be a challenge is if the British fleet can blockade. So the thing that I'm going to have to be careful of is if the French fleet or the British fleet moves back down here, unless this stack is at an outpost, um, they're going to take attrition. So there's a little bit of a dance here that we're going to have to watch out for. The, the Native Americans are fine, but it's the linear unit that I want to be careful of losing here. So something to keep in mind. Uh, and as it relates to the fleet status on this turn, turn 19, I did not roll a 1 to 3. So the fleet is actually not available this turn. I'm using this banner to just sort of be a holding area for captured FIPS and the fleet that's not present. So um, so there you go. So there's, there were some more re reinforcements that have come in. We're going to lose some stuff at the end of the turn that have the withdraw 19 just to remind you what that look. There's a 19 in the upper right. They withdraw at the end of that turn. So we're going to lose some guys as the British. And then for the rest of the game, there's not much in the way of reinforcements or withdrawals other than that next spring in 1692, the French fleet will start to matter. And that's when things will continue to get um, tricky. Right now, the French are winning. Um, so it's inter interesting to see that. Um, so let me play through 1691 and we'll come back for 1692 and see what else happens. Okay, so <clears throat> 1692, spring turn um, is where we're at here. 1691 uh, did not go well for the British, generally speaking. Um, their unit that they had as a uh, reinforcement uh, had eventually started on a trek north to Montreal with the support of a Native American unit combined, you know, with it, combined with it. Um, to kind of be a mixed force that could maybe take Montreal. Uh, unfortunately, the die rolls kind of went against them, and we basically saw the loss of that uh, end company unit. And that's a real bummer for the British because effectively that unit is not replaceable. We can't get replaced in sort of like a regular unit. Um, it had the staying power to actually try to make a, a play for Montreal, but it failed. And that is kind of their main big shot at it. So from here on out, the game is now going to be all about the skirmishing, with the exception of the arrival of the French fleet. So um, this turn is the first turn that the French fleet uh, shows up. It is going to be available automatically every spring, summer, and fall turn. Um, we also have <clears throat> an infantry on the back, uh, naval infantry, which means that this fleet can conduct some uh, attacks off the coast, basically, which means we could even target raids along here, which is going to be pretty important. I think what, what I'm not sure about is I, I assume I have to activate this infantry as uh, as a force to do that. So I, I guess I'd have to roll the default leader to do that here with, I think. I, I'm, not, I'm not super sure how that works. Um, the, the rules seem straightforward, but I don't know. I think the main thing that this does is it gives the French a capability of naval invasion. So we could see... Frontenac, and now he's been replenished uh, with uh, another unit. So he's he's got a decent stack here. Not enough to take Boston, <laughs> for sure. Definitely not enough to take Boston. But enough that we can, we can very seriously threaten various points uh, for the British so that they could swing down here, they could land and retake uh, Annapolis. I think that's probably a worthwhile venture. Um, we were trying to get this Native American unit swung around to do it, but it might be easier to move with him. Alternatively, try to come back here, more back here, and start messing around on the back line. And, and what it also does is it keeps guys on the coast here 
uh, from being, you know, put blockaded out of supply. The, the thing about it for the, the British now, uh, they failed their die roll to put, put the British fleet into play this turn, um, which means that basically the, there's sort of an uncontested naval supremacy, at least this turn, for the French, which they should make use of. But it also means that, like, this unit could come in later and could wind up going to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and putting another blockade pain on these guys in the fall, um, or could try to come in later and contest. We'd have a naval fight, which is really just a, a die roll of each side, the highest wins. Um, so it's definitely a gamble for the French to put their fleet here as opposed to keeping it in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where they're going to basically keep all the French units in supply through each winter, assuming they can just stay there and defend the Gulf. Because Louisburg doesn't exist, there's uh, usually... Uh, Louisburg, having control of Louisburg, uh, provides a sort of defense of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but it doesn't exist. So it's kind of free reign for the ships to come in and, and cause blockade issues. Um, generally, that's not going to be a problem for the British because the units in New York can trace down to here, and we'd have to send the French fleet down over here. Uh, but either way, these guys can still stay safe in an outpost for supply. Generally, the British are never going to have so many units that supply is going to be an issue. It's really a, an issue for the French. So it's a little bit of a gambit to put uh, the ship here right now. But even next turn, we can simply move the fleet to uh, the Gulf of, of St. Lawrence uh, if, we, if we really wanted to. Or we'll always make sure in the fall to put the French fleet there. And then if the British also that go in there, then it'll at least be a fight. So there's definitely, um, throughout this whole scenario, a lot of ins and outs as to who's capable of doing what. I think now that the major efforts of the British have been expended, um, the, the French, I feel like, are advantaged. And it's really going to be about, you know, how consistently can they keep the outposts destroyed on the map of the British? How well can they defend the French outposts? And that's going to determine the winner all the big plays that would have led to an automatic victory are pretty much done now uh, with with Phipps still captured, with um, the strength of the British now lying solely with Church and the uh, Schuler enlisted men who are going to have to cycle back every winter. They, there's just not a lot of staying power. So it's going to be about, you know, who can who can do some raiding um, the suppression of units so that, you know, it takes a lot of time to rebuild an outpost. So what you want to do is try to eliminate as many outposts as you can, and then the opponent's going to have that much harder of a time rebuilding them, and you want to be ahead when the game ends. So what I'm going to do from here, just because I don't think so much will have changed each turn uh, that will dramatically affect things, I'm going to instead come back in the spring of 1694 rather than 1693, just so we get a little further along um, it's a, there's a strong possibility that we're going to send Frontenac onto a naval action, um, uh, possibly to take this fort would probably be the best option. And then these guys would kind of swing around and continue to contest things, or maybe we get them over to Annapolis. I'm not, I'm not super sure what I want to do there, uh, but it seems like it's going to be worth a shot. So we'll, uh, we'll see guys. Um, so we'll see you in a couple years. Okay, here we are in the uh, spring of 1694, and very generally I would say uh, that the French are going to probably win this one. Um, uh, well, maybe. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. But there's something in the victory conditions here where it says, uh, add to the British total the number of unburned Iroquois villages... And the thing that I, it's, this is not in the rules, and I'm not sure what this is considered, like, the number of unburned Iroquois villages. Well, the game doesn't describe what a burned village is. Um, you could assume it means walking into uh, a village and disrupting a unit. But my problem with that is that... Uh, is that a permanent thing? Like, if you cause a, an Indian village to, to be taken and the unit withdrawn until 
you know, the next turn or whenever, like, it, is that permanent? It's not clear. And the game doesn't do a very good job of explaining what this even means. So I'm a little wary of that. Um, I mean, right now, if we were counting, it would be like one, two, three, four, four plus, um, what, five villages? They'd be at nine. The French would be at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, the, the French are going to win right now if nothing else changes. I think the significant thing is <clears throat> the the British or the French Navy has allowed these guys to operate and operate fairly well. We did take some step losses in a fight against Church, um, but that was enough to kind of clear out a bunch of these outposts and. You know, right now, it kind of feels like um, well, something's not quite right here. I think I forgot to pick him up. Um, yeah. As it stands right now, you know, this is a pretty potent force. Um, the naval invasion has worked well. We did get a replacement for the unit lost up here now in the spring. The uh, There's a few Native American units that are set to burn three rivers, but... Um, or to take out that outpost, but, um, you know, it's not a lot of staying power at this point, and, uh, well, I'm just not sure how this is going to play out. The rest of these tribes out here are kind of there, you know, to keep the French from doing too much more, but they're, they're really just a holding force, and at this point, um, I don't see the British having very many options. They can't even really send Schuller up on a campaign. If they're lucky, they could take Montreal. It would take Schuler and a Native American unit working together to do it, and that would certainly cause a problem for the French, but it's really hard. They have to get there in one year before they have to go home, so it is difficult to achieve that. The fact that we lost that British regular unit was a, was a pretty nasty loss. The fact that we don't have FIPS on the map is a pretty severe loss. If we were to capture a French leader, um, that would you know, maybe enable us to to operate a little bit better in exchange and get Phipps back and then be able to push back. But the, the French had reclaimed Port Royal. You know, all of this is kind of working against uh, against the British. What, what could be done is we could have Church try to come in and, you know, defeat this stack. And, and Church is a very powerful unit. It's got a three combat factor, which is fairly strong even on attack, which means they could, if lucky enough, could actually defeat that French stack and start to push things back. And because it, he always comes back in spring, we've got some opportunity. This last year, and I know it's been like the two years, <clears throat> the last year, the French fleet never showed up. I could not get them to show up at all. And so the French have made use of that to have guaranteed supply, overseas supply, and they're marching down the coast. Um, so we'll come check back. Uh, it's the spring of 1694. I'll come back in the spring of 1696, two years later, to see how much has changed. Okay, so here we are at the spring of 1696. Um, it's been interesting. Uh, the church has managed to, uh, over the course of the last couple of years, uh, defeated Frontenac's French stack and actually was able to capture the two leaders that I had in the same stack. I probably should not have included both leaders in the same stack for that reason, um, but captured both. Now, we were able to exchange uh, a leader. So Frontenac, who is our best French leader, had to stay captured because when you do an, a leader exchange uh, of POW situations, um, you have to start with your lowest ranked leader. Um, so Castine is back, but so is Phipps. And so... Um, we're kind of putting Church on the duty to maintain the outposts along the coast, and then Phipps being uh, a constant danger to Montreal. But uh, this turn, we did get a new French leader that has come in, uh, and Castine has enough replacements that have come on in Quebec to still have a potent force. And at least this spring turn, the French Navy uh, holds the Gulf of Maine, which could see uh, some landings by Castine um, down here and continue to cause disruption. Uh, 
church over time has been able to reestablish a few outposts. I've decided to, to put where an outpost could be with the counter face down, just so I can remember that's where they go. Um, so he was able to rebuild a few in the aftermath of the feeding the French stack. Uh, but it's been hard going because he's had to return home. So his objective is really to keep moving out here, reestablish control. Um, the French have not been able to come back down for a while, which has allowed for some rebuilding. Um, but you can you continue to see uh, different Native American stacks sort of getting set up uh, across the board for for, for skirmishing uh, raids. So it, it's still tight. Um, I feel like anybody could win at this point just because if the, if the British can reestablish their outposts, if they can destroy a couple of outposts, that may give them the slight edge for the win. But I think with the French fleet deployed and the ability for a naval landing somewhere over here, we could see a quick, you know, instead of having to march through the wilderness, a quick drop and that could reach, you know, wreak enough havoc to put uh, the British on the back end. And so I think from here, just kind of showing the main forces at play, there are two French uh, tribes that are not in it right now, one British that is not in it. There are four uh, Native American units up in the north. There's Porter Phipps here with the uh, sort of New York uh, New York Provincials, uh, Schuler. Then we have Church that is always coming back. Uh, there's a French unit kind of trying to hold the Lake Champlain zone, though, you know, it's kind of tough going. We, we've got this new leader. I should show him off. Uh, Valdrail. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that very well. Um, he outranks Castine, but would not outrank Frontenac if he was freed. He's got one, two, plus two uh, battalion here. In Montreal, and then we've got Castine with uh, two of those battalions to operate with, um, but a pretty clear path open right now for all these French outposts if Church can get up there and, and wreak some havoc. So um, after all this, it's still tight. And you know what's interesting, even if this scenario is pretty simplistic and maybe a little dry for a lot of it because there's so many turns and not a lot of action, because it runs quick, you kind of see the ebb and flow. And uh, the British are just feeling the shame of not having been able to capture Quebec when it mattered. Um, that could have been the end, but instead it's a, it's a real struggle here. So I'll come back at the end of the scenario, which would be the summer of uh, 1697. And uh, we will see uh, where we're at. Okay, here we are at the end of the scenario, um, and I think the British actually have snuck out a victory. Uh, there was one climactic battle between Castine's force and Church, and I tell you, just amazingly, Church got away with it, and he managed to, he entered a hex, Castine intercepted, uh, Castine's ambush failed, and then Church managed to win the linear combat, and uh, it, it was... It was uh, pretty interesting. I mean, it just, you know, there's, uh, it came down to the wire, but I think when we go to count up the points, it it's going to come out to be a British victory. So just in terms of, we're going to count up our, our outpost, right? So we have one here, one, two. This one got uh, destroyed by a last ditch uh, French allied Native American raid. So one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight outposts. And then if we're going to count uh, the number of unburned Iroquois villages, I mean, generally speaking, and I'm, and I'm trying to, to make sure I'm not missing something, like I don't think we have ever had any uh, destroyed or burned. I'm trying to see if there's any any other clues, um, but none of them, as far as I can tell, were burned uh, or entered by the French units at all. So I don't I don't know if you count it like that's the village that has never ever been walked into. But if it has been walked into, even if you're going to recruit the Indian unit in the future, that still counts against your victory points. Maybe that's the right way to look at it is if they were ever entered, you, you put a little marker on there, maybe like a raid marker, 
and say that because it's been entered, that village is burned and you don't get victory points for it. And maybe that should have put a greater emphasis on the French coming down here and at least entering those villages once to keep them from being counted for victory points. That seems fair to me uh, to count it. Like as long as it's been entered once, it's been burned. Even if you continue to recruit units from there, I'm, I'm not sure how to look at that. Um, either way, I think for the British, that, that basically means they get five more. So they're at 13. The French have uh, one, two, three, four. Three rivers got raided. Uh, so four. Then uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So if we were just looking at outposts, the French would win. But because the uh, British get to count unburned Iroquois villages they actually come out ahead by a few points, and this is a British victory. Now, I think the historical result was basically, you know, uh, I, you know, a tie, or it was like, it was basically they just, no territory changed hands over here. It was not anything major. So, you know, maybe you kind of, it all comes into a wash, but um, so, yeah, I don't know. There you go. A slight British victory, almost entirely on the back of church, helping to rebuild outposts, defeating the French in the field along the coast of Massachusetts and uh, what would eventually become, you know, New Hampshire, I guess, and Vermont. Um, and the British, uh, or, you know, the French, having nearly had it, being at the gates of Boston, but just not having enough staying power uh, to defeat the British provincials, the population further down here, could keep bringing armed men to uh, defend British uh, crown interests. Uh, and there you go. So um, just to do a quick wrap up, because this video is going to be super long by the time all is said and done and, and put together and posted. Um, I had fun with this, even though I think these scenarios are derided as being kind of uh, a little grindy and not a lot happens. I think you just need to change your perspective to enjoy it. You need to understand the puzzle of what your units can do. You know, very, very far out in the West, um, the British uh, Native American allies, uh, or the yeah, Native American allies of the British, can't do much without some additional support that they can defend their own territory and keep the British from losing victory points, which is basically what I did, having these guys set up to block and intercept any uh, attempts. So that was a success from the British perspective. Um, and then, you know, trying to figure out, can you make all of the other actions work? You know, you get those Massachusetts Provincials for a short amount of time. Do you go take Port Royal? I did. Do you go for Quebec? I tried. I nearly had it. And almost like in real life, you know, it just didn't work out. And so that kind of shuts down that avenue for the British. And then from there on out, it's just a tug of war. You know, are you able to bring your Native Americans to bear? Uh, your allies, can they do some raiding? Can they slow down the enemy? Um, it's all about that, you know, interception capability of those units to kind of disrupt the enemy and do ambushes. So you're, you're traversing the terrain of the map knowing that they may not be able to get very far unless you have a good leader to activate and always under threat of uh, ambushes. And even when you're fighting down here, it's usually slow progress fighting through those outposts and either destroying them or rebuilding them. Um, it's an interesting little puzzle and I enjoyed the time I had with it. The, the next scenario that I'll do on camera will be Queen Anne's War, which will be very similar. There's going to be a lot of similarities, but there are also a few other differences related to uh, some special rules, which we'll cover when we cover that video. But uh, overall, had a had a pretty fun time with it. I, I you know, I like the system. Um, I've been tracking it for a while. It sort of all made sense to me. And uh, I still could say that the French could have come away with a victory here. It just, in the final few turns, um, it just didn't go their way and Church just was able to operate effectively. Now, one, one of the things I could have done too, uh, which would have helped the British a lot more maybe, is try to just send him out further afield and disrupted a lot of these outposts. He, he doesn't have to count supply because he's a ranger, so he could have gone a lot farther without worrying about supply, but to me it was more important to protect what we had and just you know head up this way to disrupt things when we could kick the French back. So there's so much I think in this scenario tied to, you know, how soon will the French be able to rebuild their units? When will the uh, enlistment provincials come back? What can you do 
with them and the time that you have them and you, you're navigating that decision space uh, to be effective in this scenario. Um, and uh, it seemed to go well, I had fun. So, all right guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a very long one. Uh, this, this video encompassed an introduction to the system and the game, as well as a whole sort of scenario after action report or session report. So hope that's a nice juicy uh, morsel for you. We'll look at doing more scenarios here very soon. See you in the next one, guys. Take care. Keep gaming.